And now, Robert Marlow, brilliant man. Robert Marlow was our privacy commissioner. He was also clerk of the House of Commons for 10 years. And that's a strange job because the clerk is the procedural person who deals with every MP on the basis of their privileges. He gets to know everybody. And Robert Marlowe is one of those people that nobody will let retire. Um, when his time was up as clerk, he was asked by Stephen Harper to become the privacy commissioner. And Robert Marlowe said to, to uh, Prime Minister Harper, be careful what you wish for. I don't see the world the way you do. And Harper went ahead with the, with the hire. And Marlowe, to his horror, over the time he was there, was prevented from doing government-wide audits. He was introduced to the notion that the best way to handle a country is to make sure nobody gets information. And this is what he told me for the book. It's no longer a trickle of information coming down from the top. It's shut off. At first, there was a fog over communications. Now there is a fear over information release. Which leads me to two brief little stories. Fear. Fear is not fear is not a good character trait to be running rampant in a country that's supposed to be a democracy. But let me tell you a couple of stories. Richard Colvin, who was our diplomat in Afghanistan, who wrote the documents uh, and the emails trying to get our government to look into the detainee issue, which of course ended up uh, causing Stephen Harper to be the first Prime Minister in the Commonwealth to be found in contempt of Parliament because he wouldn't end up that information. But um, this particular um, fellow came to my place, he started talking, I could see he was very nervous, like he didn't want to be there. He kept looking at my phone. I said, Richard, is there something wrong? And he said, could I take the battery out of your phone? I said, I said, of course, if you want to take the battery out of my phone, do it. He said, because it could be a transmitter, and you could be working for those guys. Somebody moved in the next apartment. This guy came out of his seat. He believed he was followed there. He has been threatened. You know he has been completely uh, crucified publicly by people, ministers, and the prime minister. The same way Linda King was at the Atomic Energy Commission. Um, and so Richard was afraid. Another guy that agreed to see me, but set a strange condition. Meet me 10 miles out of town. Meet me 10 miles out of town in a restaurant that no one goes to. And I said, it sounds like a plan. And then that particular man, MP, told me that um, he would not vote for the budget because Stephen Harper had changed Atlantic Canada's terms on the Atlantic Accord. And it's a big, big issue. And it's Bill Casey is the MP. And you all know that he paid the price for standing up. But what people don't really understand is that Bill Casey went with a legal uh, opinion from the Department of Justice showing that what the Prime Minister was putting forward was, in fact, illegal. He had changed a document that someone had agreed to. And it was a lesser deal for Atlantic Canada. And so, he produced his legal arguments, and the Prime Minister said, Bill, these words mean what I say they mean. That was his answer. And Casey would not vote for the budget, and he got kicked out of the caucus, and then he ran as an independent and won, and then came the badgering calls from the PMO into his writing. Suddenly funds were being cut off. And when the mayor of one town called back to Ottawa and said, but we've always had this money, why, why, why is this happening? The answer came back, ask your MP. You got the wrong MP. You haven't got a conservative. Now, just briefly, before we get into the part where I get to hear what you think about this stuff and maybe some questions, I want to run through a list of things that should make all of us very worried. We haven't got a lot of time. We have to get to work. We have to get our shoulders to the wheel on this stuff. Take a look at the institutions, agencies, and practices that have been dismantled and changed without debate and without prior notice from an election campaign. Public funding for political parties, it's a big deal. We want to turn into the United States and become a plutocracy where it takes a billion dollars to run for president these days. 
National Research Council, retool as a as a adjunct to um, industry. No more pure science it has to be practical and apply to how um, industry can use it to uh, make money. That isn't how pure science works, and that isn't how great discoveries are made. Um, Canadian Wheat Board axed. Long form census canceled. First thing Stephen Harper ever did, he canceled the Law Reform Commission. The Law Reform Commission tries to stay on top of how we make a better society by having more relevant laws. But it also is a strong independent voice. Not like many of them, is now gone. I mentioned the experimental lakes area. NGO and charities. I went to a world famous Canadian artist who was going to talk to me. And then he called me back and he said, you know, I can't really do the interview. I represent, I'm associated with a couple of charities, and if I talk to you, they'll lose their charitable status. That kind of punitive vind vindictiveness is out there. And this was a guy, he would be, I think the last person in the world who would be afraid would be him. But he, but he was. Canadian Labour Congress, there's another interesting story. There's nine unions in the Canadian Labour Congress. Prime Ministers uh, Martin and Gretchen met with the CLC and the nine union leaders of the individual unions twice a year for all of their time. This man never meets with them. They are not part of his, his people. And one of the things that Stephen Harper has forgotten is when, when we vote, we don't elect a government in Canada. We elect a parliament. And every single person in that parliament has the same rights and privileges. Yeah. And the prime minister represents everybody, not just the people who put him in power. But this is a guy who has completely uh, demonized labor. And I've talked to all the labor uh, guys. They don't know any way back in with this man. If they go and speak with Lisa Raitt, uh, the Labour Minister, the, it's like a robot talking to them. She says, I represent and believe in the Harper government policy with respect to Labour, so that's not on the table. Be glad to have a cup of coffee with you. So there's nothing, there's no reason for Labour to go to those meetings. Um, one of my favorite examples is the New Health Accord. Remember how that came down? Runs up 2014. The government goes to a meeting with all the health ministers, and Jim Clarity says, put all your papers back in your briefcase. Here's the deal. Here's your check. We're going to give you 6% a year until 2017, and we're going to take it down to 3% per year and tie it to the GDP if the country's going well. You'll get more money. If the country isn't going well, you could, you'll never get less than 3 The net result for the provinces was a loss of $35 billion without debate. They didn't want input. So here's a guy who doesn't speak to the unions, doesn't allow his scientists to speak, um, doesn't speak to the premiers, doesn't speak to journalists, won't speak to me, won't do an interview, has told all his people not to talk to me. Then we come to the first time in Canadian history a federal budget was tabled without the numbers. <laughs> the Harper government tabled a budget without the priorities and planning report which gives the numbers. And the reason that this is important, and the reason this has upset parliamentary officers so much, without those numbers, MPs on the other side simply cannot do their job. They cannot hold the government to account because they don't have the information. And that is really the dysfunctionality of, of government. Andrew Coyne is not exactly a raving liberal. <laughs> In fact, Andrew Coyne and I have had a few tilts. This is what Andrew Coyne wrote, sweet. When they are not refusing to disclose what they are doing, they are giving out false information. When they allow dissenting opinions to be voiced, they smear them as unpatriotic or worse. Secretive, controlling, manipulative, crude, autocratic, vicious, unprincipled, untrustworthy, paranoid, even by the standards of Canadian politics, it's quite the performance. We've had some thuggish or dishonest governments in the past, and to that I say here and here, and even some corrupt ones, but never one quite so determined to arouse the public's hostility to so little apparent purpose. Their political legacy may prove short-lived, but it will be hard to erase the stamp of the nasty party. Wow.